Welcome to Come Follow Me, Act in Doctrine with Mariana Richardson, Stephanie Dib Sorensen, and our guest, Carolyn Rossi. Today we will be discussing Doctrine and Covenants, Section 93. We invite our viewers at home to share their comments below about your experience implementing the Act in Doctrine invitation. We will share our thoughts there as well. To learn more about our guest, see the biography in the video caption. Our doctrinal takeaways are first, seek truth in the right places, second, Jesus Christ is a being of glory, and third, set in order your house. Carolyn, as my sister, <laughs> I'm really happy to have you here. We're talking about section 93, and section 93 is the best of times and worst of times for the saints. During this time, we have the School of the Prophets, they are learning, they are growing, they're having a fabulous light truth time, but they're also dealing with a lot of persecution, especially in independence. But in Kirtland, too, there are a lot of people that are leaving the church and that are becoming the ones that are persecuting the saints. And so the Savior gives them this beautiful section about light and truth. Now, as I was looking at this section, I loved verse 19. Because for me, it was kind of an overview of the things that the Lord wants us to learn. And he even says, I give unto you these sayings that you may understand and know, first, how to worship, and second, know what you worship, and third, that you may come unto the Father in my name and in due time receive of his fullness." So we're going to be kind of talking about those three things, as well as at the very end, setting your house in order. We're going to start with how to worship. And as I was thinking about how to worship, the other thought that came into my mind was the example of John the Baptist. We have this beautiful part here at the beginning where we get John the Baptist's testimony of the Savior. And I know, Carolyn, you had some thoughts about John the Baptist in this section? Well, um, as I was reading it, and I guess it's bad when some things come to a surprise to you since I have read this all my life, and yet all of a sudden I'm going, wait a second, this is John the Baptist, and it's his testimony of the Savior. And he talks about when the Savior was baptized, and I mean, just a firsthand account and his words, and it just makes the scripture so uh, personable. And I think of how Joseph loved John the Baptist, because John the Baptist had come to him as well. And then hearing his words and, and knowing that we will eventually get all of his record as well. But it's powerful. So you've got verses 6 through 17 are the testimony of John the Baptist testifying of Christ, and verses 26 through 28, um, where he also bears testimony and talks about Christ receiving the fullness and the glory of God, which is so beautiful. Anyway, so it was so powerful to me, and I felt like I got to know John the Baptist a little bit. Well, and I love the fact in verse 12, he says, And I, John, saw that he received not the fullness at first, mm -hmm. but received grace for grace. Yes. For me, that is such a powerful testimony that I, too, won't always get all the truth at once, but instead that I will get to learn grace to grace. And a matter of fact, we have this great definition of what truth is in verse 24. And truth is knowledge of things as they are and as they were and as they are to come. And then in verse 28, he that keepeth his commandments receiveth truth and light until he is glorified in truth and knoweth all things. So there's that same principle of grace to grace as well. Right. Well, there's a wonderful talk that was given by Elder Uchtdorf at a BYU devotional. And he told the story of Ignaz Semmelweis. And I apologize no. if I said it wrong. <laughs> um, but he was an, a Hungarian physician. And what he was doing is he looked at his hospital and he compared it to another hospital. His hospital was a teaching hospital. And he noticed that the infection rate was higher at his hospital than the other one. And so he decided to analyze what were they doing to cause this to happen? 
Well, the doctors would go down and work on dead bodies, you know, <laughs> dissecting and, you know, doing autopsies. Right afterwards, without washing their hands or anything, they would mm -hmm. go and birth babies and work on, you know, the different people at the hospital. And so what he decided to do is to tell them to wash their hands. They started washing their hands after working on the dead bodies before they went and worked on the live bodies. There was a marked difference in terms of what happened with these, you know, at the hospital. The interesting thing there was many of the doctors would not believe that washing the hands had made that difference. Even though it was irrefutable, they still said, I don't believe you. I don't think that that's true. So my question to you is, have you ever dealt with that when somebody, you show them it's truth, and yet people just won't accept the truth? Well, I have an example, not from my life, but from the life of President Nelson. When he was in medical school, and um, there, was, there was a belief that if you touched the human heart, that it would stop beating. Mm -hmm. And he said that he was sitting in class, and that the teacher or the instructor said that, and the spirit told him that's not true. He just had this impression that that was not true. And because of that, that led him down a path of inquiry, and he studied and learned more, and he became part of the team that developed the concept of open-heart surgery. I think that very much we can receive light and truth in any aspect of life, spiritual and temporal, since we know that they are related, and that's just one example of how that can happen. Well, I love the story of Pilate, and I'm sorry, I'm going to have to move my scriptures here. But when the Savior's brought in front of Pilate, and Pilate says unto Jesus, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. And then Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king, to this end was I born, and for this cause came I unto the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of truth heareth my voice. And then Pilate says to the Savior, What is truth? And for me, that question is so powerful, especially given the world today. Mm -hmm. So many people ask that question, what is truth? And in section 93, as we already read, we have a definition of truth. That is what, it, what things were, what things are, and what things will be. And I wanted to also talk a little bit more about Elder Uchtdorf in this talk, because he talks about today and the problem with truth today. He says, part of our problem in the quest for truth is that human wisdom has disappointed us too often. We have so many examples of things that mankind once knew were true, but have since been proven false. If you follow the Spirit, your personal search for the truth inevitably leads you to the Lord and Savior, even Jesus Christ, for He is the way, the truth, and the life. This may not be the most convenient way, but it will be His way, the Savior's redeeming way. So I was curious, too, have you ever seen a time where you maybe have had that experience of finding truth or learning truth or feeling truth and understanding it more deeply? I had an experience on my mission in Argentina. My companion and I were teaching um, a young man by the name of Juan, and um, we taught him, we had already taught his brother, and his brother had joined the church, but now we were teaching Juan. And as we taught the discussions, um, we were having good experiences, but he was having a hard time committing. And we were very determined one day to kind of challenge him to really come to know the truth himself. And so we actually challenged him in the middle of our discussion with him to pray right then and ask if this was really true. So he was very nervous to do that, but we knelt all together on the ground. And as he prayed, um, I don't even know what he said because I was praying so hard <laughs> myself that he would be able to feel. And we felt the sweetest spirit overcome. And when his prayer was done, we looked at him and he just grabbed his heart and sat up on his bed and fell backward. Oh. Um, and he, he said, what is this? And we told him, this is the spirit of God. And he is telling you that this is true. And 
so we com we invited him to be baptized and he agreed to to be baptized and we went home rejoicing right we were rejoicing we began a fast of gratitude all these oh, things and as we went back the next morning to visit with him he had changed his mind <laughs> and we we were devastated and i kept saying but you know you know, yeah. and he said, well, you know, his girlfriend had visited him and he just didn't think or whatever, and it yeah. broke our hearts. But to this day, I know he knew, and I hope that someday that that knowing will be something that he Might will have bad. the courage to not deny. Yeah. Well, and I think that goes right back to section 93. So the Lord says, for if you keep my commandments, mm -hmm. you shall receive of his fullness and be glorified in me as I am in the Father, therefore I say unto you, you shall receive grace for grace. But the key here is keep my commandments. Okay. Yeah. There's more where that came from if exactly. you keep doing what you're asked to do. And mm -hmm. if we also go to 28, he says it again. He says, he that keepeth his commandments receiveth truth and light until he is glorified in truth and knoweth all things. And so we have this pattern and just in that beautiful story that you just said, if we don't do our part, we will not keep the truth. The truth will not be a part of us. Now, Joseph Smith taught, when you climb up a ladder, you must begin at the bottom and ascend step by step until you arrive at the top. And so it is with the principles of the gospel. You must begin with the first and go on until you learn all the principles of exaltation. Now, for me, that is how we worship, that we must remember that it will be grace to grace, that it will be gradual. Mm -hmm. But along with that, we will gain a greater understanding of who we worship, which I know is something you want to talk about, Stephanie. Yeah. Um, I really appreciate what you said, Carolyn, about uh, John the Baptist and his testimony of Jesus, because one of the things that stood out to me as he bore that testimony was how often he spoke of his glory. Uh, a few years ago, President Nelson gave a challenge to all of us to read and study more about Jesus Christ, and he suggested starting with the topical guide and reading all 57 headings <laughs> under Jesus Christ, reading the scriptures. And when I did that, the most powerful experience that I had was when I studied this section called Jesus Christ, comma, glory of. And as I read all of those verses about his glory— I just kind of felt overcome with who this person is that we worship. And I wanted to ask you, when you think of the word glory, what images does that bring to your mind? What does that mean to you? For me, it's light. You know, I think of, and light and truth yes. are also always kind of put together in the scriptures. And so yeah. for me, he is the truth. He is the light. Mm -hmm. Both of those come to mind for me. Absolutely. One of my husband's favorite words, and I think he got it from my mother, was glorious. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of seems like it comes from inside and out. It and shines. So the glory, yeah. Right. It's it kind of it's overwhelming. Yeah. Well, if we look at verse 36, it says, the glory of God is intelligence, mm -hmm. or in other words, light and truth. So you mm -hmm. hit it right on the head there. And then you said, you showed us too in verse 20, that when we keep the commandments, we can be glorified. And so that's kind of this cool thing. It's not just the Son of God that can have glory. As we obey Him, we can grow in glory as well. And um, I just wanted to share briefly, I don't think, I don't have any great insights into this concept other than the fact that I just love the way that this concept of Savior's glory makes me feel. And so I just wanted to share a couple of verses and quotes that I studied about this um, in Isaiah Chapter 40, verse 5, it says, And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. And I just think I'm so excited. You know, we've seen kind of depictions in film about like when Christ comes to the Nephites or things like that, but just like what that revelation of glory is. And, and it makes me really look forward to being able to meet the Savior when he returns. Elder Marlon K. Jensen said, when our eyes are fixed on God's glory, we feel the majesty of his creations and the grand scope of his work on the earth. We feel humble to be participants in his latter-day kingdom. If we pause and quietly reflect on our role in all of this, we will come to know 
that placing our egos and our vain ambitions on the sacrificial altar is one of the most important offerings we can ever make. And that's kind of how I feel when I read about the Savior's glory and, and his power. And, um, and then finally, I just wanted to refer also in, we're not quite there yet in our study, but in Doctrine and Covenants section 110, verse 3, it's when it describes the vision of the Savior, his eyes were as a flame of fire. The hair of his head was white like the pure snow. His countenance shone above the brightness of the sun, and his voice was as the sound of the rushing of great waters. So you get these sensory images of that glory. And for me, it just fills me with the Spirit, and I just feel so much love for him. So the testimony that really struck me as I thought about what this means and who I worship and what that worshiping means comes from Elder Richard G. Scott. He said, Jesus Christ lives. He is our Savior, our Redeemer. He is a glorious resurrected being. He has the capacity to communicate love that is so powerful, so overwhelming as to surpass the capacity of the human tongue to express adequately. He gave his life to break the bonds of death. His atonement made fully active the plan of happiness of his Father in heaven. And so I just love that so much. Sorry, it makes me, I don't know why I get so emotional about that part, but I just, when I think about the Savior and his glory and who he is and what he has done, and then I read here that I can receive grace for grace and grow in that glory as well, I think that that is such a beautiful understanding to know that glory is a process of receiving light and truth and becoming more and more like the Savior. And I'm just really grateful that the plan lets us do that. Yeah. No, I love that too. And, and I think it's interesting because when we think about that, and then we go to the end of this section, and we have a very <laughs> different kind of ending. And did you want to talk I, about that, yeah, Carolyn? Yeah, I'm sorry, I do. He's helping us learn how we can receive that glory. I love in the scriptures when there's kind of this dot to dot experience and you connect things. So I wanted to start with that scripture. The glory of God is intelligence, or in other words, light and truth, light and truth forsake that evil one. And then skip to verse 39. And that wicked one cometh and taketh away light and truth through disobedience from the children of men and because of the tradition of their fathers. But I have commanded you to bring up your children in light and truth. So bringing up our children in light and truth, when you connect those dots, is bringing them up in the glory of God, intelligence, right? Teaching our children. And then this is the sad part. In section or in verse 42, you have not taught your children light and truth according to the commandments. And that wicked one has power as yet over you, and this is the cause of your afflictions. And now a commandment I give unto you, if you will be delivered, you shall set in order your own house. There's our solution. And the reality is, um, we've all tried to teach our children <laughs> light and truth. We, I mean, we really have. And yet, um, the, the wicked one does have power. And it's hard. It's, it's really hard. Um, and I do feel sorry. This this comment was specifically to Frederick G. Williams. And at the end of that, uh, verse 43, he said, you know, set in order your own house, for there are many things that are not right in your house. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> um, I hope that part isn't, I think the Lord's asking that same question to all of us. I hope I don't have many things in my house, but but I know we all have some things, right? And And I think that is a question that we all need to be asking ourselves. And he continues to ask multiple people, Sidney Rignan and, and Joseph Smith, um, the same question, set in order your family, set in order your home. So as I've been considering this, um, I thought it was interesting that I was on my hands and knees cleaning my kitchen floor as I was thinking about setting my house in order um, because a lot of neglect um, in our home. And I think... When a woman asks that of herself, I think, well, I should say for me, I, I do kind of think of all the messy drawers and you're supposed to have one drunk drawer, junk drawer. I think I have four. <laughs> we each come up with a different answer. 
as to how we need to set our house in order. Um, but I also think physically order in your home is important because especially this year as the temples have been closed, our homes need to be a place where the spirit can dwell and there needs to be order. And it can be tricky when you've got lots of children, children coming back, you're empty nesters, but children come back and your house is full again. And when you have lots of little young children, there were many years where my house was definitely not perfect. Um, I have two sets of twins and seven children, and it was crazy, you know, crazyville. But my mother gave me hope when she suggested that um, life, when it's overflowing, uh, can be life of selective neglect. And you get to choose, right? It's the, it's the reality of setting priorities that you don't have to do it all because we can't. Can I share a thought yes, about that? Please. Because I've thought about this a lot, exactly. this idea this idea of order. And I think that, you know, why, we have people like Frederick Williams, Sidney Rigdon, and others that are, and Joseph Smith, yeah. <laughs> that they are involved in doing a lot of really great Important. things. But they were not paying attention to their home. And when it says set in order your own house— I've thought about the other definition of order where you put things in order, like number them from one to 10 or whatever, mm -hmm. and your own house should be higher on the order. And I think that just means sometimes we put our attention somewhere else. And I'm not necessarily talking about cleaning order. I'm talking right. about priority right. order. Completely. That the Lord is saying, look, I love your offerings. I love all the good things that you're doing, but your family and your home should not be sacrificed, mm -hmm. right? No, there's no question that that there is the temporal element of creating a home of order so that love can be there. I'll sometimes walk into my teenagers' rooms, right? <laughs> and you're like, wow, well, look what your life looks like, right? <laughs> it's impressive. And they feel, but the reality is they feel the way their room looks a little bit. And I'm like, if you put your room in order, you will feel better. And I think the spirit can dwell there. But no question, there's the other element of putting our home in order and prioritizing and our, our family, because uh, it also refers to families, not just the house. And then, uh, oh, let me read section or section 93, verse 50. It says, and set in order his family and see that they are more diligent and concerned at home and pray always, or they shall be removed out of their place. So that's Exactly. It's the more diligent and concerned at home and praying always, having a home that prayer is a part of that. I know many of us are familiar with Elder Bednar's talk on being more diligent and concerned at home. And I just want to, since it's been a few years, 2009, um, I want to just uh, refresh our memory. Uh, one of the first things he says, how we can do this, and they're so simple. And that's the beautiful thing about the gospel, right? It's not that complicated. <laughs> so... Um, sometimes our life feels complicated, and the reality is we need to select what things to neglect and focus on the things that are important. So the first, he said, express love and show it sincerely and frequently. And as we were driving here today, Mariana, you shared something that I thought was very sweet. Well, and I think it's really powerful in my family. We have a lot of in-laws, and so it's been interesting to see how different people have different families. Mm -hmm. And we do a lot of hugging and kissing and I love you in my house. <laughs> and it's been interesting to see other people come into that relationship and yeah. be a little bit like, whoa, Intimidated. what yeah. are you doing? <laughs> Yet on the other hand, they love it. Right. It takes a while sometimes for them to feel comfortable with all the hugging and everything else that happens. But I do think that we need to express and say, I love you. It yeah. just, it makes a difference. It makes you feel different. It, mm -hmm. it really touches your heart. Right. So I loved uh, President Monson's quote. He says, often we assume that the people around us, assuming is always a dangerous thing, right? We assume that the people around us must know how much we love them. But we should never assume. We should let them know. We will never regret the kind words spoken or the affection shown. Rather, our regrets will come if such things are omitted from our relationships with those that mean the most to us. So simple. We just express it and show it. I like that, showing it. Um, the second thing he suggested was bearing testimony to those whom we love about the things we know to be true by the witness of the Holy Ghost. 
that's light and truth, which is just what we read, that that's what we're supposed to be doing in our homes is teaching light and truth. So we need to both declare and live our testimonies with our families. And and President Bednar also talked about no hypocrisy. Well, and what happens behind closed doors, you know, right. so you might have the face right. of we're a perfect family, and then what happens when you're right. all home together? I know. that's And that's tragic, because that destroys light and truth. Um, so I love that. And so my question also to you, because we have uh, fast and testimony meetings where people can go and bear their testimony, but... I think this is so referring that we are to be bearing our testimonies to our children often, not preaching, but sharing truth throughout the day. So I'm wondering how, how, you, how you two might bear your testimony to your children. How do your children know that you know? <laughs> well, I think it's been so wonderful to have Come Follow Me and mm. how inspired that has been. So mm. many families in our family having that opportunity to be able to bear testimony and study together. Even though my family is spread throughout the country, we do Zoom meetings on Sunday where we have different people express their testimonies about what they've learned and Come Follow Me. And so I do think this home study scripture time that Come Follow Me has enabled us to have has been really powerful in yes. being able to share our testimonies with our families. I agree. Um, I have a son who just left the MTC and went into the mission field. And <laughs> while he was doing home MTC, you know, I felt this urgency to like tell him everything I haven't told him yet, which by the way, I've told him a lot. You know, they, <laughs> they, they, they're so sick of me bearing my testimony, but, but I, but there were so many times where I would just have, I would say, you know what, I have to tell him this. So I go down to the roomies in the MTC at, oh. the, at the night and I'd say, I want you to know that you will, you, because we kept saying things like, you know, keep the rules, keep the rules and stuff like that. And I said, but I, I feel like I need to tell you that there will be days where you maybe don't and you will make mistakes and you need to know that the atonement is just as much for you as it is for the people that you teach. Mm -hmm. And so just remember that if you make mistakes, I don't want you to sit in that and have anxiety wow. about yeah. you've lost your power because we've so much testified. You will have power if you keep the rules, <laughs> right? You know, but just I want I, I just wanted to bear testimony to him that the, you can take the sacrament every week too and start new and you can repent even as a missionary. And so um, that's just one example because I felt this urgency in bearing my testimony recently, but I just feel like we can do that anytime to help heal any hurt or pain that anyone in our family is feeling. Just bear testimony of the principles that, that we know will help. Well, and I love that, that we bear testimony of Jesus Christ and that we make sure that our children know that we know him and that we understand him. So I love the fact that you bore testimony of the atonement, because <laughs> I, I think that is the most important thing that he could leave on his mission knowing. Well, and I think as our children feel our love and as we express, it, and it's the feeling, right? It's that our children know how much the Lord loves them, and they can help understand that through families, right? And through the love that families have for each other. Um, and how powerful that is. The last qu uh, quote from Elder Bednar's talk, um, and this is still with number two, bearing testimony to those in our family. He said, feeling the power and the edification and the constancy of testimony from a spouse, a parent, or a child is a rich blessing. Such testimony fortifies faith and provides direction. Such testimony generates light in a world that it grows increasingly dark. Such testimony is the source of an eternal perspective and of enduring peace. So I appreciate both your comments because it goes direct, directly with that, the power of testifying in our homes, not just over the pulpit, and living the gospel. The third thing that President Bednar asked us to do was to be consistent. And I might say this was probably the hardest one that I had. We, as parents, we felt like we were always not being as consistent um, as we should have been. Um, but President Bednar, or Elder Bednar, he gave the example of a painting that is in his office. And my husband actually has taken up um, painting. Uh, and he's really good. It's too. been really, really it's been amazing. very, very fun because truly he could not even draw a straight line for a long time. As I thought of the painting that Elder Bednar was talking of, 
I thought of the paintings that my husband's been working on and all of the small brushstrokes. So this concept of consistency is each brushstroke. You're not going to do the whole painting all at once, but each brushstroke, and you can see in this painting, there's all these little dots, and if you zoomed in, you'd have no idea what it was, but each brushstroke creates that painting. And I know in our children's lives that those, it's, it ends up being the whole painting, not the individual perfect one line that yeah. they're going to remember. It's the everyday. And, and I know that's true because my childhood and my life, I don't remember every little thing, but it's a beautiful painting. And, um, and our parent, my parents were consistent. Our parents were, our consistent, parents were consistent. And they bore testimony and the spirit was in our home and um, there was order in our home. Elder Bednar said, consistency is a key principle as we lay the foundation of a great work in our individual lives and as we become more diligent and concerned in our homes. Well, I have so enjoyed right. this discussion. <laughs> and as we come to the conclusion, what should be our act and doctrine invitation this week? Well, I think it's pretty easy. <laughs> because I think we have a good I one here. I love the discussion of the glory of God and the testimony of the Savior. And yet it comes down to, are we teaching light and truth? How are we going to be more diligent and concerned in our homes? that we can do that. Oh, thank you so much for our discussion today. Thank you.